at Saturn's rings, it was hard for me to imagine how this could not be an artifact. I mean, you get this problem. There was this famous case. They they had a they were spending like ten million dollars back in the '80s, and then some senator wanted to get some publicity, and he started talking about uh, we're, we're wasting money on looking for little green men. And even though the it, the research had been very well re refereed and and vetted. They didn't, they didn't hold much water when it's, you, know, you have this soundbite sort of effect of this kind of criticism. So they dropped uh, the research, and it was picked up by the advocacy groups. I, know, I, don't try, I try to avoid the sort of artifacts on the moon kind of things and so forth. I try to, I try to stay with what's, uh, well, you can look, for, you know, you can look, but I, I would be surprised if there's any signals. <laughs> I think we just are not interpreting these, these things correctly. I think there is just a grand design, even in the solar system, that, that points to an intelligence beyond our own, but yet communicates and loves us, that put us here. In the case of Saturn's rings, unfortunately, <laughs> the, we do have a scientific explanation for it, so it's like, darn, you yeah, know, just well, anytime we think we, we've seen something really interesting Ooh. and really unique, uh, some clever uh, scientist Scientists. comes up with a rational, as we describe it, rational explanation for it, and, and Carolyn Porco, and yeah. in particular, yeah. that exact photo, the, the photo of the scalloped, the so-called scalloped, scalloped edges, yeah. shows that was a, a perfect uh, example of just the mathematical uh, simulations they've been doing of ring particles. You know, there's billions and, you know, yeah. quote Carl Sagan, billions and billions yeah. of tiny uh, ice particles. Uh, I think like, the biggest ones are only like the size of your fist or something. You mentioned the mathematics that Carolyn Porco uh, described the scalloped rings of Saturn. Is it mathematics, the language of God, as he speaks to us through, through that creation? Uh, I have an open mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm open-minded to trying, looking for anything. I mean, why not? I will pose uh, a, qu a more provocative version of, your, of that same question is, do we deserve to be in the company of other sentient beings and life forms? Hmm. Uh, and I was asked this question when I was setting, that, setting up a table for the L5 Society in the early 70s when uh, a person more than one time would come by and say, let's not mess up the rest of the universe, let's, let's, let's take care of things on Earth here first. So point of fact uh, is that that's how I've directed most of my early, early professional career, the last 30 years anyway, of dealing with the environmental issues, of analyzing water and solid waste, and finding out how Earth works. And amazingly enough, in the process of finding out how Earth works, we found out more about how the universe works, and how we will be able to go to the stars and answer that question favorably. Yes, we've done our homework. We're, we're being good to one another on Earth. We, we deserve to have company. <laughs> Well, this conference here has to do with space exploration on all levels imaginable. And uh, who knows, maybe later on we can find more things beyond the work we are doing here, which is space exploration. I'm going to step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Certainly he knew what to say uh, when he uh, stepped out on the surface of the moon also. And I think uh, history will long remember those words. Uh, they may remember some of my words, magnificent desolation, uh, but time will tell. Uh, I can say one thing that not just two people, but 24 Americans were very, very thankful that they came along at just the right time to be able to serve their country and to have their country serve to them a most exciting experience of a lifetime. Magnificent desolation. The reiteration of that effort would be a, a good stepping stone for us, absolutely. You know, we were proud that, that Buzz went to the moon in 1969. We were proud as hell, but we're not proud 
that they can somehow do it again 50 years later? I mean, what's with that? I'll be proud if NASA sends people that look like Buzz did then and sends them to Mars. Within another generation, we will be seriously on the way to, to uh, colonizing Mars. And that's going to be a big, that's going to take a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of uh, international cooperation. In terms of the initial push to humans to Mars, while I'd prefer a private approach, at this point, the government's going to have to lead it. The only institution that has got the capability, technical and financial, to uh, mount a humans to Mars mission right now is NASA. So we need a government decision to do it. We need to mobilize the uh, will of the American people into an effective political force to make the government do it and to have the government stay doing it and so that we don't just land on Mars, but that we settle Mars. By bringing together industry, government, and academia on problems of critical national importance. And they help in promote technologies that they are critical for space exploration and at the same time critical for life here on Earth. And one of these technologies is the one we are pursuing, which is based on communication networks, which is a technology that is focused on bringing people together by communicating among people and also by allowing various things that people do to, with devices and with robots and sensors and satellites and phones and all of the things you want to do in your life. I think that nanotube, nano materials is very important and we have a technology in this field. The cheapest and most abundant energy is from the sun. Uh, basically, as the saying goes, it's raining soup out there, all we need to do is build the bowl. The uh, idea of solar power satellites, roughly the size of the island of Manhattan, able to produce 10 gigawatts of power has been kicking around for over 30 years. An asteroid hitting uh, uh, causes a lot more damage than an airplane crashing, so if one happens every 10,000 years and kills you know, 10,000 people, that causes a lot more collective uh, danger than, than, a, than a plane crash. So it's, uh, but your statistical probability of dying from an asteroid over the lifetime of the human race is about the same as it is of, uh, of dying from a plane crash. So it's, it's a not, tri not trivial uh, concern. In the 1840s, it was the gold rush that gave the economic clout to help make the United States a superpower. And what we're saying is that we want to go to the moon to get resources like the platinum group metals in order to provide the resources for us to move to the hydrogen economy and to ignite uh, a further economic renaissance in that particular area to solve our energy problems here on the Earth. Transfer one on approach. We'll pull the hydrogen into reserves. Our next delivery is two weeks away and it will help tide us over. Locks reserves are at 80%, so we're fine there. Well, the first thing, of course, is to find them, and, and that's one of the, a lot of the discussions that uh, uh, NASA and, and even private individuals and other countries are putting a lot of effort into finding them. Uh, the, the one that they've actually found now, uh, about a year ago, is, is designated as 2004MN4. Uh, the idea would be to put a transponder on this. There's a lot of uncertainty whether it's actually going to hit or not. It's got a very small probability, but it's not zero, it's a percent or two. Uh, so if we actually put a, a small spacecraft, a transponder, we could get very, very accurate uh, uh, orbits for this and determine whether it's really going to hit. Then if it looks like the probability becomes higher, we could, uh, there's a number of ways to, that you could potentially divert it. Uh, some of them are fairly simple, some of them are not, but once we determine there's a reasonable probability, we can get to work on it. We could be on Mars within 10 years of program start. I'd like to be on Mars in 2014. We could. I mean, look, it's not that hard, okay? We know much more about how to go to Mars today than we did about how to go to the moon in 1961, and we were there eight years later. We know much more about how to go to Mars today than we did about what we had to do to win World War II, and we did that in three and a half years. Okay, if this country decides to do something, we can do it. And until we decide to do it, we can't do it. The sooner the better, I believe. Most people think that the best way to get out of space is uh, space shuttle, which is fine. 
uh, but the best way to get payload up, the best, the cheapest way to get payload up, the way we see it today, is to use a space elevator that can carry a very high payload for a very, very low amount of money. We are already working in outer space with people from the International Space Station, all the astronauts and cosmonauts. The Research Partnership Centers, and as a representative of all 12 directors, appreciates the opportunity to be here at the National Space Society and participate in this tremendous meeting. We applaud their efforts and wish them continued success. We are meeting with other research partnership centers, and we all together, we have a set of technologies that is very critical for space exploration. So what we hope to establish is uh, a better understanding of how our technologies can help and have others understand how our technologies can help in space exploration. Over the last seven years as being a U.S. representative to various technical working groups and committees, it is of our best interest to keep exploring the avenues available to us for concentrating in the sciences to include space exploration. I'm very supportive of uh, space travel and space adventures. Hawaii in fact, looks a little cloudy I'm, I'm an today. entrepreneur of sorts in terms of my own businesses having to deal with space. But in, to answer your question, I don't know. Uh, there, of course, we've had problems with the shuttle fleet, so the shuttle fleet is being uh, phased out, I, I understand, over the next 10 years. And I think that there's going to be a new generation of spacecraft coming in. And of course, you look around, you see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs here who are very active in space. Of course, the X Prize and the uh, Antares project that's, that's coming up, the new Antares Prize. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. I believe that you'll be going to resort hotels in orbit before there are military routine, military operational flights that go to orbit. We don't know what going to space is for. And we don't give a damn. <laughs> because when hundreds of thousands of people will fly, and those people won't have to spend years at Houston being trained to follow a checklist and know they'll never fly again if they don't follow the checklist, you're going to be a hell of a lot more creative than the NASA astronauts because you're going to do it for fun. And you're going to figure out why we're going. How many people want to fly in space? You know, one of the things that, 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 that makes it so that these big guys don't give a damn that they have to pay $80 million for a booster is that, well, our payload costs $600 million, so, you know, the booster is just small change. Well, for crying out loud, they have to spend that much for a payload? There's some payloads that will pay to fly. <laughs> these payloads can be easily reproduced by unskilled labor. If you'd have asked me what we would have 40 years later, I would have thought, well, what do we have 40 years earlier? <laughs> and if you'd have told me no more performance, I'd have said, what the hell happened? Well, they said, well, we got better radios. I think the American people really support the idea of, of human expansion to space. I, I think what we have is a situation where uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the gatherers are few. We need organization. We need to create organizations that can mobilize the will of the American people on this issue to an effective political force. No one knows the future. Right now, the people, the horse that's at the front of the race, the one that has the best chance of doing it first, is NASA. The American space program, for all its problems, is um, the most effective space program in the world right now, and it's the one that has the most resources and the most skills to send humans to Mars. Now, it's quite true, however, that if we continue to fumble, if we fumble for the next 30 years the way we fumbled for the last 30 years, then we won't be the first to Mars. The Chinese, perhaps, will be the first to Mars. Okay, And the human civilization, as it grows on Mars, will take its point of departure from contemporary China and not from contemporary America. What we need to do is to accept the challenge of working a partnership between those that are interested in adventure in space, first suborbital space and then orbital space, and work a partnership between the government 
so we can share the assets as necessary and have not only wealthy people able to travel into space as non-professionals, but open up space in a nationally accepted method of selecting the broadest number of people who have an interest in making a small investment and having some highly credible system select by random selection in some process the rest of the people Neil who can take advantage of the great experiences that a few of us had in the Gemini, Mercury, Apollo, and the Space Shuttle program. We'll get back and stir up some lunar dust once again. Uh, I certainly would like to see that happen in the time frame that the uh, Bushes at least uh, indicated. And then, uh, you know, eventual human exploration of Mars. Of course, there should be funding towards the space program, and I think it's very important. I mean, space exploration, it um, enhances everyone's lives. It's not just about getting out there. I mean, experiments done in space really uh, help in the medical field and Control advises you really go for detach in five, four, three, And two, what this allows us to do is to talk about and to dream about what kinds of missions will be going on in their lifetime, what kinds of things will be discovered on Mars, and how they themselves will probably and possibly be involved on some level as technicians, as engineers, as scientists, as astronauts, as people working on propulsion systems and whatnot, that they have many levels of opportunity to work in the space program um, for our future. Yeah, I think, you know, regardless of what we do and don't know, I think it's absolute necessity that we keep learning. You know, I mean, there's never a point when we should stop discovering things and stop learning new things. There's, there's always more to be discovered. We encourage every nation for space exploration on all levels. As I said, space exploration has brought a lot of benefits to Earth on all levels imaginable. Well, the, uh, the device that you're going to have on the moon is going to Planter collect data. Nominal, uh, and then that data will be sent up. to a satellite orbiting the moon. And then it will be sent directly to Earth. And the plan is to be able to do that by addressing that device from your desk, whether you're a scientist or a student, so you can actually observe the experiment while it's happening. We're also doing uh, systems, putting together full virtual reality systems with uh, head-mounted displays and head-tracking sensors so that we can make these installations at museums and science centers all around the country so people can experience actually being on the moon in a fully immersive environment. My job is to open a pathway that the youth can come down. Um, my, my job is to go out there and help clear that that, that path to the future so that people who are growing up right now have a place to go, have a place to place their dreams. Space is a blank slate. It's an empty canvas. It's a place where you can draw out your own ideas, you can paint your own vision. Space exploration is um, incredibly important to society and I think man will continue to explore as far as we can go are bringing benefits to Earth and to all humankind. The moon, in fact, is more than just a simple stepping stone. It's our training ground, our proving ground, our test bed, our exploration experience place. It's the way we're going to practice to learn how to live in space. Mostly what I think needs to be repeated is Mr. Rutan's comments at the um, keynote session on Thursday is that what we need most of all is the willingness to take risks, the courage to do things that might fail, and if you're not quite willing to do that for yourself, at least the willingness to let other people risk their money, risk their lives, going outside the envelope, going outside where no one has gone before. We did compete our valve, our injector, our igniter, and the rocket science inside, but, but scaled made a very difficult decision, 
and patented a new configuration of hybrid rocket motors. We did have to develop our own uh, rocket motor. It was extremely important to me that we could do a worst case reentry, i.e. straight into the atmosphere, uh, worst, worst gamma, and that we didn't have to control it, why it jackknifes itself for reentry. This is extremely important that we didn't have to control it in order for the crew to survive. In fact, on, on one of our powered flights, uh, uh, just before the space flight, we re-entered upside down. And again, the pilot doesn't control it. I would like to encourage congressmen to embrace, um, to embrace risk and to embrace the fact that we need to take some risks in order to get, uh, to get to where we need to go. And I required on the very first run that everything be flight hardware, flight weight hardware. There was no boilerplate, no subscale, none of that. If that ain't going to work, you want to find out on day one, not day last. Yeah, maybe it was risky. And it is risk by which we define our lives. I have a, an 18 year old niece, she's about to graduate, and I've got a number of uh, step nephews and step nieces. And they're not, if, if I, I have to be careful how I say this because they're watching. But I get the impression is the future as a concept does not impress them because I think they're really concerned about today. And at first I got depressed about that because I'm a futurist. Now I realize, no, it's actually, it could be good because what they're really about is the present. And so, whereas me as a futurist might be happy with, well, someday, someday we'll actually go out there. They're like, no, if we're going to go, let's go now. These are the people we need to actually do the job because they're, they want it now and that's what we do. We actually want it now. We want to go to the moon now, not 30 years go Right now, the commercial offerings are Alan Shepard rides and to go from an Alan Shepard ride to a John Glenn ride is a logical step where people take three, four orbit day trips in a comfortable vehicle without rendezvousing with the destination. We think that is a plausible market in and of itself and there has been some interest on, uh, on some people's parts about developing orbital vehicles. We want to make this product available to small investors and we're looking for companies that will make access to space cheaper and that will provide more people with access to space goods and services. To go from there to a destination requires uh, another three to five years because you have to build it and you need to build the components. You need to have heavy lift sort of EELV class or proton class capability to be able to launch the components for a space station, but you don't need a big vehicle to launch the people. The five people, six people ships going to hotels on a weekly basis can be done with uh, basically current technology. I think the big thing is to show a benefit back to individual communities of the United States. A lot of times people look at the International Space Station or the Space Shuttle and they say, well that's just a Houston, Texas thing or that's just a Kennedy Space Center thing in Florida. When in actuality, space technology and the advancements from space technology help all of us in our everyday lives. So I think that's the biggest and uh, most direct route to get space technology out to the American public. By that time, we probably will have some sort of a handle on fusion and if not, uh, even the regular fission type nuclear power will probably be far more acceptable in space where it can be kept well away from human habitation. I took this presentation and showed it to my dad on the way here yesterday. He is, was born in 1916. And when the first airliners were out there flying the public, he was 12 years old. And he used to go down to the airport and watch these rich people get on board these transportation things.
I mean, if his family would travel anywhere, they would go by train. And they also went by Model T. But, but to go to the airport and watch these things, and he told me he didn't really have a knowledge or a belief that he'd ever be able to do that himself, that he'd ever travel by air in his lifetime. Because there were just a few people doing it. It was risky, yes. First few years, your chances of dying when you close that door on the airline are about one in 6,000. That's risky as hell. You know, Buzz doesn't think it's risky. He knew it was one in 62 when he flew. Unless you had that commercial operation, unless you make it available to the rich people, unless you mature it, unless you structure to get high volume, then he wouldn't have been able to fly. Your possibilities for hope become more and more limited. If we open space, that completely reverses. At that point, the panorama of possibility that becomes available to you is limitless. All check. Transfer one on approach. Even in the early days of experiments aboard the uh, Russian space station Mir, they were growing wheat and rhubarb, and I believe they were even doing sugar beets. So essentially you have all the materials you need to make a pie in the sky. When I was a kid, I used to go out at night in the backyard, lie in the grass, and just stare at the moon. So there was something that just pulled me. I, I call it the human space connection. For me, it's a very spiritual thing. It just was something I was compelled to just, I love to go out and look at the moon at night. You're living in a uh, space station as small as Mir or even the current International Space Station and trying to grow most of your own food. Yes, you are going to be almost strictly vegetarian. But once you Landing get into a larger All uh, structure, large knock. enough that they can um, be called space habitats, then you start to have enough space where you can do fish farming, where you can grow chickens. The first uh, Earth rise for human beings in orbit uh, naturally occurred on Apollo 8. And uh, we've heard many times the crew exclaiming, what a beautiful sight, where's the camera? By the time we went up there, we were the third crew to observe the same experience as we came around the side of the moon getting ready to separate in the spacecraft. Uh, that scene had been seen before, and, and we knew it, but it was still a most beautiful sight. Nearly everybody I know, at least, wants to go to space. They want to fly in space. They want to see the Earth, the blue marble, the fantastic picture that the early folks on Apollo 8 took of the Earth. By the way, that's the most popular picture that NASA has ever published. And that's what the real issue is. Uh, our destiny is not to be constrained to the Earth, but to go out into the universe. And uh, we're taking the few first small steps. They were initially taken 40 years ago. We want to go on now with everybody. We're in an incredible time in human history. Uh, one into the same moment. 
We have created the technologies and capabilities to completely destroy the planet and all life on it. Yet at the same time, those technologies and capabilities the give us the, the ability to expand life to worlds that are now dead. We have the possibility to reach no outward beyond this planet and carry civilization into an ever endless expansion. What does that mean? That means ever limitless vistas, ever limitless possibilities and excitement. The future can be one of two things. I don't think we're necessarily going to wipe ourselves out. We may wipe ourselves out, the planet will probably keep on going. But the scary thing that I see is that we might create for ourselves a future that is vanilla, dead, dry. That now is the most exciting time in space exploration since Apollo went to the moon a generation ago. It's the time to get involved so we can all enjoy the benefits of this program, which come to all of us right here on Earth every day. Jobs, inspiration, new technologies, advanced information technology, learning, textbooks. These things all come together as we explore the environment we live in, which is space. So the Space Frontier Foundation's Return to the Moon Conference, as you can tell by the title, is focused on what does it take to return to the moon in a sustainable manner. So that means not just for science, not just for exploration, but permanent settlements that ultimately represent every form of human activity that you see in any city here on Earth. So that means resources on the moon used here. That means people living, working, studying, even playing on the moon. Again, what we do in space should be seen as no different from what we do here on Earth. People all over the world believe that this is what we have to do if there's going to be a positive human future. We got to break out of the shell. We got to break out of the limits of this planet. We got to become a multi-planet species. The desire to explore, the desire to understand, the desire to be, a, a, I guess the desire to really know our place in existence. You know, whether you come at it from a religious point of view or a scientific point of view, it's all ultimately what you said. It's part of the human spirit. And, and I go back to the phrase I use, the human space connection. I believe we are all connected to our universe, connected to this planet. It's, it's what created us, where we came from, whether it was God, whatever you want to call it. But we were created to live in this environment. And this planet is part of a bigger environment, the solar system, the sun, the galaxy, the universe. But that kind of a possibility is very exciting. Uh, learning about the origins of life in space, um, or uh, the origins of life, let me put it that way, is a tremendous, exciting idea. And I think it will be the primary stimulus for, in fact, spending the money and having the tenacity to go on to landing on Mars with human beings. And they have a lot of water in the form of ice, and they have found methane, and where there is methane, I think we can find water. This is the case here on Earth, and I believe this, it is the same thing on Mars. And uh, I believe in the near future, we here on Earth are going to find good surprise on Mars concerning Inhabitants. I think uh, you can see here that we have a tremendous mixture of imagination and engineering. That's the, the Disney phrase, imaginary, imaginary, right, Ronnie? That's right. And this is an opportunity that's available to everyone, not, not just Americans or young people in this country, but people all around the world are going to participate people, in this. And this is going to be a, a, a true a venture of the human race. Mm -hmm and we're going to show how we can work together as, as one people on Earth of many different faces, and we're going to reach the stars, and we're just going to keep going. For all its problems and imperfections, the uh, most hopeful branch of, of, of human society, the one that offers the most to people, is Western civilization. I would like to see Western civilization be the point of departure for the further development of humanity as we move out to the planets and the stars. Our aim is to go to space, to colonize space, to go to the moon, to return to the moon, to go to Mars, 
and beyond to explore every possibility I in outer space. It's time. Time has come for a new space. A new space. Next stop, Hope you all has, got your luggage. Um, new space has very, very important role in entirely space industry and space development. So please give us and please give me a new space industry. <laughs> all the world's stage. People are players and they have their time upon the stage. Say your lines and then you're off. Okay. Well, this is our time upon the stage. If Western civilization and if the American version of it okay, is to have a major role in shaping the future of humanity as we move out to other worlds and other solar systems, we must seize the time. You're going to see before the end of the decade, I firmly believe, you'll see uh, passengers buying tickets for suborbital flights, whether it's on uh, Richard Branson's uh, Virgin Galactic space vehicles or rocket plane. You know, there are several companies looking to do this. So I would say definitely by the end of the decade, probably sooner. So America, prepare to buy some passenger tickets to go into space. Seven minutes time expended. Okay, you can make a mark, Houston. Roger, four one. Incidentally, you can use the uh, shadow that the staff makes to just uh, getting it perpendicular. Buzz, Buzz is erecting the solar wind experiment now.